I'd like to start out by thanking Freemind for inviting me to this conference. It's really an, an honor for us to be here, and it's, it's such a pleasure to be sitting in between two very exciting groups and, and colleagues of ours, CIRM, who um, has been collaborating with NIH in ways that you heard about, and also our newest um, player in the NIH innovation space, ARPA-H, which will follow me um, right after this talk. So as you heard in the introduction, I'm the director of the seed office at NIH. And, and what the seed office is, is basically the commercialization assistance and accelerator component of the NIH. So our team of more than 30 industry veterans and staff help scientists and engineers and doctors take their cutting edge scientific discoveries and convert them into healthcare products. So SEED was formed about two years ago, two or three years ago, to really consolidate and coordinate those types of efforts across the entire National Institutes of Health. So what's the role of NIH in the, in the, in the innovation ecosystem? What, one of the key points I want to make today is it's not just about the funding. And it's not just about funding for basic science especially. So in the main introduction today, you heard about the, the scale and the size of NIH's small business funding. And that funding is growing to $1.7 billion every year of non-dilutive funding. So that really makes us the largest single source of seed stage funding in the life sciences. So, Many people, I think, outside of, of these circles really don't appreciate the role that NIH plays in that early stage of product development. But in addition to that, NIH has plenty of other translational research and product development programs that support that transition of scientific discovery into early stage product development. And you'll hear more about many of those programs or some of those programs from subsequent speakers here today from the National Institutes of Health. One of the things I've noticed about this uh, JP Morgan week, which I guess everybody's probably noticed, is that there's lots of concern about difficulty with ra raising funds right now. And that's one of the real benefits of the NIH funding. You know, our funding is not only the largest source of seed stage funding, but it is a stable source of funding and it's growing every year. And that's because it's mandated by law to be a fixed percentage of the NIH's overall budget. So it's another reason to really um, pay attention to NIH as a source of innovation in that space because we will be here um, even as other sources of funding wax and wane. But in addition to that funding, I'm going to describe today our entrepreneurship and business development support that comes along with that funding. And that part really helps our portfolio projects stand out because not only is the technology itself de-risked, but the business case is de-risked in parallel. And that's really what makes the projects that are supported by the NIH Small Business Program powerful um, candidates for future development is, is that tandem process of de-risking the science in parallel with de-risking the, the business case. So I'll, I'll start with how we support the initial jump of scientific discovery from the laboratory, from the academic world, into early stage product development. And then I'll describe um, how we support those efforts through our national network of proof of concept centers. And then I'll go on to describe how our small business program can allow investigators and spin out and start up companies and small businesses all around the country to access that $1.7 billion of non-dilutive funding. And then I'll talk a little bit about the wraparound commercialization services that, that we provide. And one of the things I want to do is I, I really, I'll let the folks around town this week decide if we're doing a good job 
because on this slide, you can see that there are 35 NIH-supported companies that are presenting at the Biotech Showcase and Resi this week. So I really hope that some of these companies that you see on this slide are some of the hottest prospects around. Um, many of them are companies that, that have benefited from the types of services that you're going to hear about today. So the NIH Proof of Concept Network was started about nine years ago, and there's a, there was a specific problem that we were trying to solve. So many innovators working in the, the academic community make scientific discoveries, and they, they get the impression, or they, they have a glimmer, that that discovery could be very important, could lead to a very important healthcare solution. But then they're stuck because they don't really know what they need to do to take those next steps. That's the first problem. So a problem of kind of knowledge and understanding about how to enter into product development, but also a lack of access to funding to help them perform proof of concept and validation studies because Many of you who have, support, who have submitted grants to the NIH, or if you work in the academic environment, you know that those kinds of product development projects and early stage proof of concept studies are not really the type of studies that fare well as basic science R01 research proposals. They're not necessarily exciting, um, you know, discovery science, and so it's really a difficult space to be in. How do you do that initial proof of concept? So we talked to many stakeholders across the whole spectrum. We talked to industry, investment folks, we talked to the university tech transfer offices, we talked to innovators themselves, and we, we developed a program that combined a number of critical elements that you see on the right of this slide. So the first one, is funding for product validation. So, as I said before, that funding is so hard to come by, but when we set up these centers, we wanted to create kind of local ecosystems to support this type of work. So not only did we provide them with funding, we required that those centers bring in matching funding from non-federal sources. And a side benefit of that requirement was that it really forced these centers and hubs to bring in their local ecosystem partners to help with these projects. And so that's a really critical component. The funding has that matching piece to help develop a, a local innovation ecosystem. The second piece is all of these projects that are funded through this network are milestone-driven projects, and they're managed by project managers that have, many of whom have industry experience managing technology development projects. And that is certainly a, a unique um, experience for many academic innovators to have a project managed in that kind of industry style, tranched funding um, manner. So that's the second critical component. The third one is we provide plenty of entrepreneurial training and resources and, and to help people understand and develop the process literacy to be able to make that jump from a science project to a product development project. And then the final critical piece is personalized feedback. And that comes not only from the local industry experienced personnel who are involved in the centers and hubs, but also from the NIH side coming from our team of commercialization experts and also feed early feedback from the FDA and CMS and USPTO on every single project that comes in to, to request funding. So that, that combination of four components is really the core of these centers and hubs. They're scattered all around the United States, and you can see on this map where they're located. And if you go to our website, which you'll find at the end of this presentation, you can find more details about where these centers and hubs live. So you might ask yourself, well, does this approach work? Is it successful? And we take great pains to collect outcomes of, across our network, and we funded over 400 projects across this network, which is covering 
over 80 academic institutions and nonprofit research institutions around the country. And those projects have led to 111 startups. And, and many people in the audience, especially if you are associated with a startup or a spin-out company, can appreciate that that number of startups coming from 400 academic R&D projects is really, in and of itself, an astounding outcome. But maybe the most impressive outcome is that those projects have gone on to garner $1.9 billion in follow-on funding. So these projects are really being developed in a way that is making them very attractive to continue on for future product development. Now, I know that many people here are, are here to, to hear more about the small business program and the SBIR program at NIH, but one of the reasons we developed this academic network was that we wanted to give people the opportunity to feed that pipeline of the small business program. So we wanted to facilitate that transition of technology out of the academic world into startups and into our, our main source of seed funding for small businesses. And you can see here that there have been 145 SBR and STTR applications and 49 awards. And that doesn't even take into account the applications that haven't been reviewed yet. So the bottom line there is that the success rate of those projects is roughly three times the normal success rate for small business program applications. And we really take that as strong support for um, the, the value of this program. It really validates that this approach is creating strong projects that are, that are de-risk both in the technology and in the business case. And in addition to that, um, we're also educating and training innovators all around the country. Thousands of people have participated in the training activities that are offered across the network. Um, that follow-on investment number is also impressive when you consider that NIH has only spent $52 million total on this network to date. So that's tremendous leveraging of the NIH investment in this network. And it's, it's also important to note that we will be funding five new hubs this fiscal year around the country. Uh, and there's a $20 million investment to fund these five new hubs. And the due date for the applications is February 9th. So the good news is it's available for five new hubs. The bad news is you really need to get moving if you, if you hope to get your application in on time and compete for that funding. So one of the main things we're really trying to do at SEED and at NIH is change the culture of academic innovation and entrepreneurship. We, for many years, people have really thought of NIH as primarily funding basic science research, and there's been this chasm between what happens to those discoveries as, as they transition into product development. Where do they go, and, and why, is, why are we spending over $40 billion a year on basic science research? Where, where is that money going? So we, in the, in, our, in the course of our activities across the, the network, we're constantly trying to understand where the pain points are and where the pressure points are that prevent the transition of those technologies and seeing what role we can play in helping to move them forward. And these are just two examples of things that we've been working on to really help that. The first on the left is we worked together, starting in 2020, we worked with our entrepreneurs and residents and many of our tech transfer office colleagues and the Association of University Technology Managers to try and figure out how we can help make it easier to, to basically develop those startup and spin out companies in a, in a more simple and straightforward way. So the, the team of people who you see on this slide, the organizations have worked together since 2020 to come up with a model term sheet. And you know the actors in, in these plays still need to decide on the dollar amounts and the percentages. And there are always going to be some details that, that need to be worked out. But this model term sheet really helps to demystify and kind of level set expectations for financial and control terms, especially for early stage innovators who have never spun out a company before. 
And so you can, there's an email address down at the bottom if you're interested, you can send a message there. That model term sheet is free and open and available for anyone to, to access. Another thing we've been involved in is we, we've heard from, from many innovators, especially younger innovators in the university system, that they don't want to get into product development because they need to worry about getting tenure. And those types of activities that are associated with product development and spin-out companies and SBIRs are just not producing the, the publications and hitting on the metrics that are required for them to get tenure. So a number of years ago, the National Science Foundation funded an organization called Promotion and Tenure for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. It was based at OHSU in Oregon to really try and change the academic culture of promotion and tenure to include a, a emphasis and an appreciation for innovation and entrepreneurship. And NIH has supported that effort mainly through our National Network of Proof of Concept Centers, and I'm happy to report that there's, there's really some progress being made there around the country that I think that due not just to those efforts, but to a broader appreciation around the value of technology transfer and translational research and a, a, a more public view on the fruits of, of our labors in the basic science world, many of the universities are, are starting to incorporate some of these recommendations. So you can check out this science paper and, and see more information about the, the recommendations that have been made by that group. But these are just two examples of how we're also helping to change the culture of innovation around the country. So I'll, I'll switch over now to talking about our small business program, the SBIR and STTR programs. So this program, th this slide here just shows where does that funding sit in, in the kind of innovation life cycle here. And really, we are, we're covering work that bridges that gap between basic science research and scale up in manufacturing. There are even some components of our program that fund those types of activities. But that funding is really sitting right in this sweet spot that, that many people consider to be one of the valleys of death. So um, a few years ago, the Small Business Administration rebranded the SBIR and STTR programs as America's Seed Fund. And so this new logo and this new um, terminology you'll, you'll run into, but when you hear America's Seed Fund, that's really the nomenclature now that's used to describe the SBIR and STTR programs. And it's important to remember that all of the major R&D agencies of the federal government have SBIR and are required to have SBIR and STTR programs. So DOD, DOE, all of the major agencies um, have SBIR and STTR programs. And they will all be starting to use this terminology of America's seed fund. So it's good to kind of get used to that because I think it actually is, is a really nice way to message the value of this public investment. And I think it makes it a lot more clear for not just the investigators, but for the investment community to understand what the small business program is really all about. So this slide is, is really just a basic graphic that, that describes how the program works. And most of these features are, are common actually to the small business programs of all of the agencies. It's a phased program, a phase one to determine feasibility, followed by a phase two to perform research and development. There's a possibility to basically apply for both the phase one and the phase two together in a fast track, or if you've already proved feasibility through other sources, to jump directly to the phase two award. And that direct to phase two is, is really a popular part of the program. But one of the reasons why it's so popular is as NIH funds more early stage product validation in the academic environment, like I described before, there will be more and more projects that have already developed that 
that feasibility and that product validation through other sources or through other um, funding sources. And it's really nice for companies to be, not to have to waste the time to go through a phase one if they've already proven that, that feasibility phase and jump directly to phase two. So phase, the, the direct to phase two program has become really popular. Um, in the intro, there was some discussion about how the budget limits have gone up for the phase one and the phase two, and I've got the, the rough numbers listed in the lower right of this slide. But a really important point to make here is that we have the flexibility to basically fund above these budget limits for topics that um, require a lot of money to do work in. And as all of you know, life science product development is expensive. So if you, if you take a look at our website and you take a look at the NIH funding opportunities, you'll see that there are many, many very broad topics where we have budget waivers to award budgets that are higher than these statutory limits. So if you're an investigator, you're writing an SBIR, um, you should bear that in mind. And I'll also say, you, you could probably do this calculation um, using our publicly available information, but I'll just note that the median award sizes for phase one and phase twos at NIH are roughly what these budget limits are. So um, that just gives you some indication of the ability to access greater levels of funding. Now in the middle of this slide, you'll also see that we have the phase 2B program and the CRP program. The phase 2B program provides additional funding. Th these programs provide additional funding on top of the SBIR funding. So at the end of the day, based on the budget flexibility and these additional programs, it's not uncommon for successful companies to receive, say, five to seven million dollars total of non-dilutive funding for NIH for their project. It's, that's if they're successful at proceeding through this tranche funding model. But that's some real serious money. A lot of good work can be done for that amount of money, and the non-dilutive nature of that funding is important. But we've also found in talking to our investment friends that they, many, many venture firms and especially angel investors, they really see NIH SBIR funding is validation of project, especially on the technical side. So it's, it's a real, um, there are a number of reasons why SBIR funding is good for small businesses. One is just for the money itself. Two is the validation that it provides but also for all of these wraparound commercialization services that I'll talk about in a minute. So in this slide here, I just list on the, on the left here some of the really important aspects of the small business program that you need to take in mind, take into account when you're submitting an application. And you can see on the right the, the funding opportunity receipt dates. A few years ago when we started our office, we, we developed a new website and we tried very hard to answer all the questions that applicants have and provide as much information as we can for people um, to, to get information about the program. So I'm not going to go through a lot of the details of how the program works. Hopefully you can find most of that information on our website or in the funding opportunities themselves. But what I am going to do is tell you a few tricks that are super important. And perhaps the most important piece of advice is to talk to a program officer well in advance of submitting your application. So we are government employees and we're here to help you. Um, the program officers are constantly working together with potential applicants to answer questions and provide guidance for them. And on the website, in the lower left, you can see that we make it very easy for you to find the right program staff to talk to. And even if you can't find the right program staff to talk to, you can always email us and, and we'll respond. 
and you can always email our office and ask questions also. In the last year or two, we've, we've moved to a new system of providing um, responses to people who, who email us questions about SBIR, and I'm happy to say that our average response time is one day. So there may be some outliers there if you have a complicated question, but for the most part, you can get immediate feedback by emailing us and asking us questions. We also have lots of application resources online. Some of, I'm just gonna highlight a few of them. So in addition to the application instructions, that's one thing. We have an annotated form set, but what people find really useful are the sample applications. And over the last few years, we've expanded the number of sample applications that are available. For example, when we started receiving many more applications in the digital health space, we worked together with our program staff to put together a sample application for a digital health project. So these, app, these sample applications are, are really super, super helpful. Um, it, it really gives you an opportunity to see um, what a successful grant application really looks like. One, one of our goals is to increase the number of new innovators who are, who are in the SBIR pipeline. And we also have an application, a, a new program called the Applicant Assistance Program, which provides more direct application assistance to innovators who've never had an SBIR award. So that's also a great program to check out. Another tip, and I, I know I've, I've talked to people, some people this week at, at receptions, and they say, yeah, you know, we submitted an application, we didn't get funded, and that's the end of the story. And one of the tips that we like to tell people is be prepared to resubmit. Many applicants, it takes more than one shot for them to, to have their application funded. And we find that so often that we actually put together this slide based on some feedback from two of our innovators who, who really um, can speak directly to that issue, how they, they were not successful in their first one or two go-rounds, but you actually do get good feedback and review that can help you strengthen your application, and it's important not to, to give up, to persevere. And, and if you do persevere, you have a better chance of being successful. Um, another thing that I hear, especially at receptions in the evening when people are really speaking their mind to me, is they say, you know, we feel like this game's rigged. You know, it's not for new applicants. These are serial entrepreneurs that are coming in and collecting up all this SBIR money. And I, I just want to tell you that one of the important statistics about our program is that a quarter of all of the applications that we fund go to new investigators. So year upon year upon year, um, that's been true. So a quarter of those awards that we're giving out are, are actually going to new investigators. And we're very strongly committed to encouraging new applications, particularly from underrepresented innovators or from underrepresented parts of the country. So we, NIH has a very broad definition of diversity. It includes not only underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, but individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds, and women who are underrepresented in life sciences. And we have a number of programs to try and increase diversity in our portfolio. But it's, it's really worth just saying a word or two about, a, a little bit more about that commitment to diversity. It's not just diversity for diversity's sake. The reason that we're interested in bringing more unique perspectives to the portfolio is because we know that People are passionate about the issues that affect themselves and their communities. So those are the topics and those are the projects that people are working on. And if we're looking around at the really troubling health disparities in our country, especially that have really been just laid bare by the COVID pandemic, you know, that is how you have to address the problem. You have to have people in your portfolio 
that are working on the projects that are really important to them. So that is why we're trying to increase the, the reach of our program and trying to bring people into the portfolio who don't have experience going after that NIH funding. And one of the ways that we do that is we have a special program that provides SBIR companies with money to hire people from diverse backgrounds. So we will give additional money to SBIR companies to hire people from all different career levels and backgrounds. And the funding level ranges from $5,000 to $100,000 for these supplements, depending on the candidate's career level. So for those of you that already have SBIR awards, I strongly encourage you to go and check out this program because it's good not only for the companies because it allows them to bring in some additional support staff, but it's also good for, we found that there are many postdocs, grad students, recent grads who, who really can use this program to make their way into product development. So I really encourage people to check this out. This is just one example of our diversity efforts, but it's, it's maybe the most tangible one that's directly tied to our small business program. We also have a, a relationship with MedTech Color, and I know that MedTech Color had some events this week, but that's an organization that's working to increase the diversity in the medical device industry. And so we have a formal relationship with them as well. So I'm going to transition now to, to talk a little bit about the commercialization assistance services that we provide. A, a few years ago, um, it, it, it is now possible to receive specific technical and business assistance in collaboration or as a part of your small business award. So in your application, you can request funding for technical and business assistance that you can use to hire vendors that will help you minimize technical risk and assist with commercialization. That funding is, is, is limited to up to $6,500 per year for a phase one or up to $50,000 per project for a phase two. But what we're really excited about at SEED is we have stood up two commercialization assistance programs that are our our TABA services that we provide for our portfolio. And you can't have the funding and these programs, but, but we really think that these programs are valuable, especially for companies that are not deeply experienced in product development. So the first one is for phase one companies, and it's called the needs assessment program. So many of you probably are recall or are familiar with the niche program, the niche assessment program, which in the past provided a market research report for phase one companies. So the needs assessment report is kind of an evolution of that concept. So what the, what the needs assessment report does is it, it really tries to assess the, the readiness of a phase one company along four really critical technology domains market need and competitive advantage, IP and barriers to entry, business model profitability, and manufacturing regulatory and clinical plan. So this program is administered by the RTI Innovation Associates, and they have a very deep bench of commercialization experts who work together with the applicant companies to provide these reports. And it's really important because not only does it provide a, a, a rather comprehensive gap analysis for these phase one projects, that in and of itself is important. Because especially with projects that have spun out of the academic environment, a lot of times there's not a lot of awareness or understanding of all of these other components that are so critical for commercialization. So it's really useful to get some feedback, um, unbiased feedback on these different domains for a project. But the other benefit is that this needs assessment report can be very helpful for phase one companies when they're creating their application for phase two of the SBIR program. 
So when they need to develop that commercialization plan for their phase two, they can use this needs assessment report to guide them. And not only that, they might use the needs assessment report to help them determine what they could use that $50,000 of TABA funding in their phase two for. So the, the needs assessment report is a, is a great program. It's, it's rather new, it's about two years old now, but we're getting great feedback from innovators. And um, we would encourage all phase one companies to take advantage of the needs assessment program. So in the phase two, we provide targeted consulting services for phase two companies as part of our centralized TABA program. So the service areas are IP strategy and services, market analysis, regulatory strategy and services, and reimbursement strategy and services. So we work together um, with an external project management organization so that if you apply for this TABA consulting services through us, we work together with you to, first of all, identify what your greatest need is within these four categories, but then we work together with our external service provider to identify and fund a vendor to provide those services for you. So if you're a company that already has a vendor and, and you know who the best person is, or maybe you have a board member or one of your investors knows the right people to provide your commercialization services, perhaps you, should, you could receive your $50,000 and do it on your own. But for many of the companies in our portfolio, it's a real benefit to be able to work together with our commercialization team and our outside vendor to help identify the right vendor that can provide the services that you need. And not only that, we help you identify them, we help write the statement of work, and we provide the funding for the services. So it also saves a huge amount of time and effort on the kind of administrative side to receive those services. So these are, these are some of the central programs that we provide, but there are lots of other things that we do to provide commercialization services that kind of you know, make up the secret sauce of what we do. And I'm gonna talk about a few of them here. So we have an entire stable of regulatory and business development co consultants that work together from within our office, from within the seed office, to provide entrepreneurial support and training and consultation to people within our portfolio. They're assisting academic innovators that come through our proof of concept network. They're assisting small business innovators in our, in our program. They contact, innovators contact us with questions all the time and we can provide specific guidance to them um, based on the expertise of our staff. But not only that, we also have the added benefit of being a sister agency to FDA and, CDC and CMS. So a lot of times we can help collect information or point people in the right direction when they need help from those other agencies as well. So these regulatory and business development consults, you know, they're not like your typical government employees. These are folks that have deep experience in industry. Many of them are, are startup founders. They're serial entrepreneurs. They come from large companies, strategic partners. Some of them come from the investment world. So they have a really broad set of backgrounds and they, they provide the kind of assistance that is very, very valuable for innovators to receive. Um, and they do that in a, in a free and in a confidential way. So another aspect of our of our support is in the entrepreneurial support programs that are, that are provided by the National Institutes of Health. So many of you may have heard of the i program or the C3I program, the Concept to Clinic Commercializing Innovation Program. These are programs that help, that help innovators really understand um, through learned experience what they need to do to make their projects successful. The i program is primarily a customer discovery program. It's based on the business model canvas. Um, 
And that program, NIH provides for its phase one SBIR companies. So that's another opportunity that's available for our phase one companies. We're also, there, there are a number of academic versions of the i -Corps program, many of them which we support through the various hubs of our proof of concept network. So there are also opportunities for i -Corps for academic innovators that are supported through our efforts. C3i is, ha, has kind of a broad range of innovators that it supports, but it's more focused on medical device um, applications. But those entrepreneurial support programs are a great place to, to strengthen projects that are from innovators who maybe don't have as much experience in the entrepreneurship space. So another major component of our activities is focused on partnering and investment opportunities. So we realize that the funding that NIH provides for life science small businesses, we're, we're not an, under any illusion that the funding that we provide, even if it's $7 million, is really a drop in the bucket compared to what it's gonna take for most innovations to make it all the way into the healthcare marketplace. So a really important aspect of what we do is we focus intently on trying to understand what happens to these projects once they complete that SBIR funding. How can we position them well to continue on in product development? How can we position them to get the funding that they're gonna need to continue on in product development. And so one of the things that we've done is we've developed relationships with many of the kind of partnering and investment meetings that, like Biotech Showcase, that you can see on this slide. Bio, the MedTech Conference, LSS, Resi, um, and, and others, to basically buy slots for our portfolio companies. And then what we do is we use our team of experienced entrepreneurs and residents to pitch coach NIH portfolio companies and prepare them to go to these meetings. So we're really, we're, we're working to kind of close the gap between those external investors and our projects. And I can tell you that the, we, we get so much feedback from the innovators that are coached by our entrepreneurs and residents. It really is, especially for those who have never done it before, it's an invaluable contribution to their fundraising efforts. We also have a formalized relationship with the Angel Capital Association. So not only do we send NIH portfolio companies to ACA meetings and events to pitch, but we participate in their monthly life science sector calls. So it's really a great two-way relationship there where they, they can tell us what areas they're seeing that um, angel investors are interested in. We can tell them the kind of hot scientific and technical areas that are, that are emerging from our pipeline and it's, it's really been a great relationship. And it's, it's an educational experience for the NIH team to really understand what angels and investors are looking for and how they make their decisions. That's really helped us to guide our companies, but it also helps ACA to understand how our portfolio works and how they can find the types of projects that they're interested in to consider for funding. So that's been a great relationship. And we've also Oh, oh, we coach about, we pitch coach and, and send out about 100 portfolio companies every single year to these types of meetings. And what we've done is we've basically created a website that catalogs all those companies. And they're really like our most investment ready, later stage SBIR companies. So if you're one of those companies, it's a great way to get exposure and have your name out there. Um, if you're an investor, it's a great way to, to mine for companies. You can search by event, you can search by technology type, by state, and it's really a nice way to, to get a snapshot of those companies in our portfolio that we have trained up and sent out to these events. Another thing that I'll, that I'll mention that's kind of cool is that all of our information about the projects we fund is publicly available. So you can find the, all projects that NIH funds 
through a public website called NIH Reporter. But we've also been working with PitchBook and Cypher Bio and Global Data to make sure that those business intelligence databases are pulling in information about the NIH investments that the companies and their databases have received. So that's another way to really um, get a view on what NIH is funding. Um, in the future, I hope that all of our investments and all of our companies will be, will be trackable in those databases. So we, we go to great pains to, to really communicate our successes, and we produce one-page success stories for a general audience that really highlight great examples of patient impact from our portfolio, projects that have really made it into the wild, things that you know the public and our legislators will care about. We write these stories and we've cataloged them on a website where you can search them. We've got 85 stories now that span 41 states. I've just given a few examples here. The first example, Nuvox, I put on here because they're actually a biotech showcase company this year. So you may have seen them present earlier in the week. But I included these other two companies because part of the reason we have this website, getting back to bringing new innovators into the program, like everybody understands that we support small molecule drug development projects. People know that we support medical device projects. But a lot of people say, you know, you don't support the kinds of projects that, that I'm interested in. And, and actually, digital health projects, um, women's health projects, minority health projects, there are so many areas where NIH has an increasing footprint. We're not only funding those areas, but we're trying to highlight them. And so we have two success stories here from, from the site that, that illustrate some of the types of projects that we can use, not just to illustrate our success, but also to entice new innovators and say, yes, we do fund projects in these areas. Take a look at these exciting examples of, of positive outcomes. So now that I've, I've talked about those examples and, and explained a little bit about the, the commercialization services that we provide and how we, how we view technology development, I want to close by telling a story that really highlights the power of the NIH approach um, to supporting technology development. So at the beginning of the pandemic in late 2019 and, and early 2020, it was really clear that one of the things that we would have to do as a country is rapidly develop diagnostic tests for SARS-CoV-2. So Congress provided NIH with $1.5 billion of emergency funding, emergency supplemental funding, to help develop new tests for SARS-CoV, to help develop tests for SARS-CoV-2. So the way that NIH decided to do that is really a case study in the power of how we support early innovation because what we did was NIH developed a program called the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics Program, or RADx. And what RADx Tech did was they were able to get this program going in a matter of weeks because they built it upon an existing proof of concept network that already existed at NIH, provided the same types of funding, the same types of commercialization assistance, expert feedback, um, milestone-driven product development. That program, the Point of Care Technology Research Network, already existed at NIH. So basically, in the snap of a finger, NIH was able to leverage that network to go after um, diagnostic tests for COVID. And not only that, we leveraged our relationship, our close relationship with the FDA and CDC and CMS and our federal partners to really move on this project as fast as we can. And, and it's a testament to the ability of NIH to it, it, basically using a turbocharged model of how we support innovation, we were able to produce 50 EUAs 11 of the over-the-counter tests for COVID-19 come from the RADx program. And as you can see from this graph on the left, the cumulative capac test capacity that for tests that were supported by RADx is now 
um, over 5 billion tests. So this is like a really tangible example. Like in, in a very, very short period of time, many people would say world record time, these products were many of, many of which started from academic founders, went from product validation um, all the way through initial testing, manufacturing scale up, product validation, EUA approval, and on the right-hand side, you can see just some examples of the, of the tests that were supported through RADx, including Alum, which was the first over-the-counter test that was approved in December of 2020. So that program started um, in, in, in a number of, uh, in, a, in a handful of months, in less than a year, that test was in the hands of, of people across the country, across the world. So it's really a nice example of how that combination of funding, um, hands-on commercialization assistance and interaction with NIH, utilizing external commercialization resources, providing commercialization assistance can really bridge that gap between basic science discovery and products and services in the hands of patients. So if there's, if there's any question whether NIH can, can be helpful in this space and plays a role in this space, I think RADx is a really great example of the impact that, that we can have. So I, I hope that, um, that the information that I've provided has been useful. You can always find more information on our website. You can email us. We have a very active social media presence on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um, we also have a listserv where you can sign up to get um, information and updates from us. And, and we also are, th this is actually the first event in person that I've been to since the pandemic started. Uh, we've been working remotely, diligently from the comfort of our own homes through the whole pandemic. But, um, now we're back out on the, the circuit and working to increase awareness and find new investigators and provide people with direct assistance. So we're happy to be here and, and I'm happy to take some questions too. Thank you very much. So well, thanks for a great presentation. I have two points I wanted to make. One, uh, I noticed an example of, sorry, I'm still recovering. I noticed that in the example that you showed of um, grant applicants who had to resubmit, um, you highlight two um, female uh, leaders. So I know I've heard constantly from SBIR and the SEED program that you are really committed to um, having a greater representation of female leaders like myself, but that has not been my experience. And I'm wondering how fully committed is SBIR really to that, to minority female leaders? And also, why not allow us a forum where we can, I think you could learn a lot from that. I mean, you have us fill out these application survey forms, but I don't ever see that being used in any meaningful way. Thank you for that question. I, I really appreciate that question. We, we, we are trying to develop programs and, and services that really have an impact on people. And, and in, on that side, um, there are a few things that, that I can say related to that. One is that within our own office, we've worked really hard to really walk the walk, not just talk the talk. So, Many of our, in fact, I think the, the majority of our entrepreneurs and residents are women. The leader of our small business program, Stephanie Fertig, the leader of our innovation support team, Chris Sassiella. And, and we really feel strongly that by setting that example, that's one way that we can help to um, increase the number of women in the small business program. We also have one of our proof of concept centers in Kentucky the entire leadership team and all of the product, the project managers are all women in that program. And they've had a tremendous success and we've learned a lot from them about how to effectively reach um, women innovators. So that's another example. 
It's a difficult problem. We're also trying to recruit more women reviewers because we feel that that's one way to um, really address the, the issue that we're trying to solve. But it's a difficult problem. The problem's been identified in, in the finance and investment world. Um, we are always interested in, in new solutions to that problem. So I'd be happy to talk to anyone about um, collaborations or partnerships. I think it would be a great idea to put together like a, a study group or a, or a um, you know, a listening session. I'd be, I'd be happy to pursue that, absolutely. One last question, the accelerator cups. I didn't notice California in that. What's the correlation for SBA and our So our, our academic network is not directly tied to the small business program, but one of our proof of concept centers, one of the original ones, was actually a collaboration of all of the UC medical schools. So that, was a, that center was funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and contained all of the UC medical schools. Yeah, this is a question about the timeline for application and how fast can I get my money kind of thing. Yeah, so the, so the first thing is we, we are statutorily required to, to provide two levels of peer review for every application that NIH funds. It's, it's a legal requirement for us. So, but we have tried very hard to squeeze every bit of time out of that pathway as we can. What I can say is when you submit your application for those standard receipt dates, usually within the first three months, your application will have been reviewed by the study section. So most times, three months from application, you'll have a pretty good idea of whether you're gonna be funded or not. And that level of certainty is important for people. So that three month benchmark is really, really important. So that's the first part. The second part is we're constantly trying to, to squeeze the time down to when you get your money. And the average, the, the median is about, is about nine months now. It used to be longer. We've gotten it down to about nine months, but um, that process requires the submission of just-in-time information about things like, and assurances from companies uh, to meet all the requirements. So we're always trying to squeeze time out of that, that timeline, but we do, have, we do have some hard legislative rules that limit how short we can make it. We would love to have the flexibility to make it shorter, but you'll hear in the next talk from ARPA-H, they, one of the real benefits of ARPA-H is that they have a lot more flexibility in their funding models than, than we do. Yeah, that's a great question. I would love to answer that question. So what Kentucky did, when they formed their center, they, they brought in all of the technical colleges across the state of Kentucky. And you might say, well, okay, that's great, but are the, are the technical colleges really gonna submit projects that are, that are gonna be selected for funding? Not only did they bring them into the program and bring them into all the entrepreneurial training and education parts of the program, but they actually set aside a portion of the funding that they devoted to product development projects to projects that came from those technical colleges across Kentucky. So each cycle, of their funding, they fund one project from one of those technical colleges. And it's a great way to bring them into the program because not only do they participate in the education and training, but they know that they have a shot at getting funded for their R&D projects. And it's been a great way to really, ex to, to kind of expand the horizon of, of the types of projects that we fund. Should I take one more? Yeah, yeah. take one more question. We'll take one more. Yeah, I have a question around uh, healthcare disparities, and do you all have a portfolio approach to say, here's how much going to invest in your healthcare disparities, or it's just undetermined? Well, that's a good question. 
So the NIH SBIR budget is basically divided up by all of the different institutes and centers, the 24 institutes and centers that form the NIH, and the funding for, for the small business program is proportionally divided um, to those institutes and centers. So there is, a, there is an institute at NIH for minority health disparities, and they have a small business program. So they actually have their own funding dedicated to the small business program for those projects. So I'd be happy to, to put you in touch with the people that directly select and manage those projects. So for the disease centers like diabetes, other work centers where there's health health care disparities, they don't have a mandate or a portfolio program? Yeah, minor health disparities is an area where there, there is some work that's funded within the other individual institutes and centers, and but in addition to that, there's there's dedicated funding there. So that's an area there where there's a little bit of crossover. There are some other examples like that too. What's it? Oh. You've been selected for uh, probable funding for the NIH grant, the SBIR grant, in one group, like let's say the Center for Disease Control Research Institute, and then the other group for could then I also go to the healthcare disparity group because we're looking at healthcare disparity in that and then get double the funding? <laughs> so the amount was $2 million. Our problem funding grant was, we were told, max out of 1.7, but our general study that FDA approved is, you know, well more than that. I would be happy to talk to you about that after this talk, but I, people, you can submit as many applications to NIH um, as, you, as you have projects, but what you can't do is get funding from more than one institute for the same project. So, um, but I would be happy to talk to you about how, how you can uh, brainstorm about how you can fund your project. Thank you very much. Thank you.